Dr. Fauci, we don't know whether the pandemic started in a lab in Wuhan or evolved naturally, but we should want to know. Three million people have died from this pandemic, and that should cause us to explore all possibilities. Instead, government authorities, self-interested in continuing gain-of-function research, say there's nothing to see here. Gain-of-function research, as you know, is juicing up naturally occurring animal viruses to infect humans. To arrive at the truth, the U.S. government should admit that the Wuhan Virology Institute was experimenting to enhance the coronavirus's ability to infect humans. Juicing up super viruses is not new. Scientists in the U.S. have long known how to mutate animal viruses to infect humans. For years, Dr. Ralph Barrick, a virologist in the U.S., has been collaborating with Dr. Shi Zengli of the Wuhan Virology Institute, sharing his discoveries about how to create super viruses. This gain-of-function research has been funded by the NIH. The collaboration between the U.S. and the Wuhan Virology Institute continues. Doctors Barrick and Xi worked together to insert bat virus spike protein into the backbone of the deadly SARS virus and then use this man-made supervirus to infect human airway cells. Think about that for a moment. The SARS virus had a 15% mortality. We're fighting a pandemic that has about a 1% mortality. Can you imagine if a SARS virus that's been juiced up and had viral proteins added to it, to the spike protein, if that were released accidentally? Dr. Fauci, do you still support funding of the NIH funding of the lab in Wuhan? Senator Paul, with all due respect, you are entire, entirely and completely incorrect that the NIH has not ever and does not now fund gain-of-function research in the Wuhan Institute Do they fund of Dr. Barrick? We do not fund... Do you fund gain, Dr. Barrick's gain-of-function research? D Dr. Barrett does not doing gain-of-function research, and if it is, it's according to the guidelines, and it is being conducted in North Carolina. Not you don't think inserting in a bat virus spike protein that he got from the Wuhan Institute into the SARS virus is gain of function? That is you would not be in the minority because at least 200 scientists have signed a statement from the Cambridge Working yeah. Group saying that it is gain of function. Well, it is not. And if you look at the grant and you look at the uh, progress reports, it is not gain of function, despite the fact that people tweet that. So do you still support it? sending money to the Wuhan Virology Institute? We do not send money now to the to Wuhan uh, do you Virology Institute. We support sending money. We did, under your tutelage. We were sending it through EcoHealth. It was a sub-agency right. and a sub-grant. Do you support that the money from NIH that was going to the Wuhan Institute? Let me explain to you why that was done. The SARS-CoV-1 originated in bats in China. It would have been irresponsible of us if we did not investigate the bat viruses and the serology to see who might have been or, infected Or perhaps it would be irresponsible China. to send it to the Chinese government that we may not be able to trust with this uh, knowledge and with this uh, incredibly dangerous viruses. Government scientists like yourself who favor gain-of-function research... I don't favor gain-of-function research in China. You are saying things that are not correct. Government defenders of gain-of-function, such as yourself, say that COVID-19 uh, mutations were random and not designed by man. But interestingly, the technique that Dr. Barrick developed forces mutations by serial passage through cell culture that the mutations appear to be natural. In fact, Dr. Barrick named the technique the no see -em technique because the mutations appear naturally. Nicholas Baker in the New York Magazine said, nobody would know if the virus had been fabricated in a laboratory or grown in nature. Government authorities in the U.S., including yourself, unequivocally deny that COVID-19 could have escaped a lab. But even Dr. Xi in Wuhan wasn't so sure. According to Nicholas Baker, Dr. Xi wondered, could this new virus have come from her own laboratory? She checked her records frantically and found no matches. That really took a load off my mind, she said. I had not slept for days. The director of the gain-of-function research in Wuhan couldn't sleep because she was terrified that it might be in her lab. 
Dr. Barrick, an advocate of gain-of-function research, admits the main problem that the Institute of Virology has is the outbreak occurred in close proximity. What are the odds? Barrick responded, could you rule out a laboratory escape? The answer in this case is probably not. Will you, in front of this group, categorically say that the COVID-19 could not have occurred through serial passage in a laboratory? I do not have any accounting of what the Chinese may have done, and I'm fully in favor of any further investigation of what went on in China. However, I will repeat again, the NIH and NIAID categorically has not funded gain-of-function research to be conducted in the Wuhan Institute but of Virology. You do support it in the U.S. We have 11 labs doing it, and you have allowed it here. We have a committee to do it, but the committee has granted every exemption. You're, you're fooling with Mother Nature here. You're allowing super viruses to be created with a 15 percent mortality. It's very dangerous. I think it was a huge mistake to share this with China, and it's a huge mistake to allow this to continue in the United States. And we should be very careful to investigate where this virus came from. I fully agree that you should investigate where the virus came from. But again, we have not funded gain of function research on this virus in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, no matter you're how parsing many times words, you're parsing you say words. it, there it was didn't research, happen. There was research done with Dr. Xi and Dr. Barrick. They have collaborated on gain-of-function research where they enhanced the SARS virus to infect human airway cells, and they did it by merging a new spike protein on it. That is gain-of-function. That was joint research between the Wuhan Institute and Dr. Barrick, you can't deny it. Senator Paul, your time, time has expired. Dr. Fauci, I will let you respond to that. We need to move on. Excuse me? You're, I will allow you to respond to that, and then we'll move on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say, we, I, I don't know how many times I can say it, Madam Chair. We did not fund gain-of-function research to be conducted in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you. Senator Cassidy. Thank you. Let me just follow up right there, Ms. Arthur. Uh, you allude to it in your testimony, and going back to what Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Burr said earlier, um, um, Congress gave a billion dollars to CDC to upgrade information systems. Mm -hmm. And I was specifically asking last year for more money for immunization information systems and was told that billion was going out to states in order to upgrade, that that's where it was targeted, because I was frustrated with CDC's inability to give real-time data. Now, Mr. So it seems as if we're advocating for dollars of which a billion has already been appropriated and we're told this is where it went. But, Mr. Becker, in your testimony, you indicate that in Washington State there has been inadequate money to upgrade the immunization information system. I say that because it seems like there's a disconnect here. We gave a billion. I was specifically told it's going to go to upgrade state information systems, and I'm hearing from a very innovative state that you have inadequate resources to upgrade. So let me ask, did you receive money from that billion that we gave CDC last year? Uh, thank you, Senator. I will have to go back and find out how much Washington State actually received from the CDC. But I can tell you that whatever we received was not adequate to meet the needs of what we have faced today. Now, it could be that the state used it for something else. Let's just be fair to CDC. Uh, unless they came down with a specific, a specific instruction to spend it on uh, immunization information systems. But it does seem, let me just ask in your testimony, you do mention that, you know, you had a hard time keeping track, but this is exactly what informa uh, immunization information systems are supposed to do. Why was Washington State's not adequate to do so? So thank you, Senator. It's just the scalability and interoperability that I mentioned in the very first part. But of in the interoperability, you mentioned about EHRs, mm -hmm. but the way if a child is given a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, the, the provider actually enters that. Uh, so, and, and we've had other states come in here and testify that their IIS uh, was able to, is currently accepting adult immunizations on COVID. Now, I guess I'm just exploring. I'm not trying to accuse. I'm just trying to understand why this is not the case. You know, why isn't it the case in Washington? I think it's the disparate system. So you have very big hospital systems that can invest the infrastructure to send those things seamlessly. seamlessly. You have private providers that don't have that access. What I'm, what I'm not sure access. about, though, if a pediatrician is sending measles, mumps, rubella in that big hospital system, mm -hmm. clearly the mechanism occurs. I won't belabor, but it does seem I'm just not, I'm just not getting a clear picture into what the problem is. Okay. We give a billion to CDC. Somehow it's not happening, and yet the system works for childhood immunization, but it's not working for adult. 
I won't belabor. Ms. Dr. Jantz, um, I think he, one thing is clear. You mentioned in your testimony the need to have uniform standards of care. Fecal material is hitting the fan, and we don't have enough ICU beds. I probably used that line in my diarrhea lecture. Um, we don't have enough ICU beds, but then we learn that we're putting too many people in ventilators. And putting on ventilators at too early a stage actually was associated with negative outcomes. How do we, I have to think that there's probably uneven uptake of that information in ICUs across the nation. I don't know that, I'm just assuming. How do we establish that uniform communication of care when, when how we manage a ventilator patient to ventilate or not really is critical in terms of both ICU utilization but also the patient's survival? Yeah, thank you, Senator. It was, it was vital for us to be able to spread evidence-based medicine, how to prevent patients. How did you do it? Via the Louisiana Department of Health and the Department of Health and Human Services when we conducted seminars with hospitals around the state and the nation where they asked us, how do you solve these specific operational problems? We gave them answers. Now, were you also able to give them like a checklist? You yes. Know, uh, so you worked. Yes, we shared with them all of the materials we developed in our own hospital we stepped outside of the silo of an individual hospital system and shared all of I don't of mean our to interrupt, but I'm almost out of time. And you went nas nationally. Who sponsored your national outreach? ASPR with the Department of uh, Health and Human Services. So hats off to ASPR for pulling that together. Absolutely. And did you were, able, were you able to demonstrably see that, that, that how patients were being managed kind of stayed in lockstep with best practices across the nation? Yes, it did catch up over time into what now, is... over time, how long over time? A month, a week? Oh, on the scale of weeks. Uh, it was very quick. Hospital, the feedback I got from hospitals... Around One the... more thing. You know, we were short... I got a call from an anesthesiologist in San Francisco when things were really bad in New Orleans. He goes, we've shut down electives, but, but, but COVID hadn't hit us yet. We should be sh shipping all our machines to you, and then you ship them back when it hits us. Because we understood there was going to be an uneven kind of implementation on it. Never happened. Instead, we're scrounging to build new ventilators when they were sitting idle in many parts of our nation. Uh, I just say that because I do think part of what we are doing here would be to source existing resources where they're needed from one part of the nation to another, as opposed to attempting to build from scratch a lot of machines that are very sophisticated, but then we don't need them when it's all done. Um, so anyway, with that, I thank you all for your service and your testimony. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you, Ranking Member Murray, I mean, Chair Murray and Ranking Member Burr. I really appreciate this bipartisan hearing. You know, I'm